A main U.S. stock index hitting all-time highs, reaching a milestone never seen before. That's coming up on Business Matters. Good afternoon and thank you very much for being here with me on this afternoon. I'm your host, Don Ma. Okay, to start off, the Dow Jones Industrial Average crossed 40,000 points for the first time. It closed just below that today, but it is the index's fastest 10,000 point climb from 30,000 to 40,000. The blue chip index has recovered nearly 40% from its October 2022 lows. Um, meanwhile, uh, the other indexes, S&P and NASDAQ was mostly unchanged today. Um, other data out today that investors are looking at, jobless claims here. The number of Americans filing for new claims for benefits uh, last week fell, unwinding nearly half of the jump at the start of the month. Also, manufacturing output, production at U.S. Uh, factories unexpectedly fell in April and a decline in motor vehicle output, as well as U.S. import prices. It rose by the most in two years in April amid rising costs for energy products and other goods. All right. Joining us now is Joseph Trevisani, Senior Analyst at FX Street. Joseph, if you can hear me, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you? Nice to be back. Yeah, good to see you. So let's talk about it. Uh, what does it mean, right? Hitting 40,000. What's the significance here? Well, the markets are becoming more confident that the Fed is not going to have to raise rates. You saw a little bit of a well, when CPI came in, it was the first time it had been expected and as uh, anticipated in the month. And the year on level was actually a little bit lower than the prior month. So that's the first time that's happened in a couple of months. So that is the reason it is the market is getting comfortable and happy about the idea that the Fed is not going to have to raise rates. Doesn't mean the Fed's going to start lowering rates anytime soon, but at least half is better than nothing. So you're saying this this rally today, potentially an extension from yesterday, because that's when we got the CPI report. Yes, I think so. Um, you're also seeing taking today because I think the, the last I checked, the Dow was off a little bit. But yes, that's this is yesterday's run, which was the one that which really took it higher. And that was all interest rate related. And what about fundamentals here, Joseph? Is, am I wrong in saying that potentially taking a, a back seat here to expectations of what the Fed can do? Well, what's happening with fundamentals is they're not really changing very much. The, if you look at the job numbers, they haven't really altered very much. They're a little bit lower in the last month, but the average over the past six months is quite good. If you look at today's number, jobless claims, again, it was the highest in, since I think February, but it's such a low number that it really doesn't relate. It was 218,000 on the four week moving average. If you look at the GDP, GDP was a little bit lower in, well, it was about half in the first quarter uh, at 1.6%. But if you go back and average it over the past year or the past six months, it looks pretty good. It looks very healthy. So there hasn't been a lot of change in a lot of the fundamentals. And so the market needing something to trade on is trading on interest rates. All right, hit, hitting the 40,000 milestone, definitely a bull, bullish signal. No, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. Well, it we... is. As long as, long as the, the interest rate um, picture stays the same. I think if I remember about 15 years ago, somebody wrote a book called Dow 40,000, and it was poo-pooed at the time. He meant it in a much shorter span of time, but here we are. As long as I think the markets remain convinced that the next move in the Fed is going to be to lower rates, then I think you have potential for more upside. There's nothing else to trade on at the moment. And the picture looks pretty good from that point of view. Is the Fed going to lower rates? And speaking of rates, uh, what is your assessment on how many uh, we're going to get today, uh, this year rather? Well, I don't think we're going to get any. The markets are still saying, uh, at least in the Fed future, that the first uh, rate cut will be in September and then one more before the end of the year. I am not party to that. I actually think that there are going to be no rate cuts this year. The main reason is because even though we didn't get a rate increase in the CPI, we didn't get much of a decrease either. And it is now May. We're heading into June. We're almost at the six-month point. And I don't think f inflation is going to come off given, in the Fed's own words, 
to give them confidence that it's moving towards 2%. If the inflation rate, the CPI, particularly, but also the PCE, linger where they are now, which seems to be what's happening, the Fed has no reason to cut rates and no excuse to cut rates. Well, it could be that the market is wrong or that the Fed may have to cater to the market because a lot of investors expecting at least one or two rate cuts. So somebody's got to be wrong here, Joseph. You're right. Someone does have to be wrong, but they don't have to be wrong yesterday or today or tomorrow because we're not going to know about the Fed's rate cuts, at least in the market's own predictions, until the fall. So there's plenty of room between now and then for all sorts of trading ideas, primarily the one the market is working on right now, which is no rates and then perhaps lower rates. So there's plenty of room and there's plenty of time for the market to trade in a particular direction, in this case up, until it is proven wrong. All right, Joseph, always great to speak with you. Thank you very much for your time today. A pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right, moving on from that, it looks like fewer people are considering buying an EV this year compared to the year before. Uh, this is according to a new study by J.D. Power. So the study shows that 24 percent of potential vehicle buyers were very likely to consider purchasing an EV in 2024. And this is down 26 percent from a year ago. The percentage of those who said they were overall likely to buy an EV also dropped. Um, the question here is, what is behind the decline, right? Well, according to J.D. Power, um, there's not enough affordable EVs, also not enough charging stations. Also says that people not fully aware of the benefits of EVs. Uh, some other factors here include uh, stubborn inflation, high interest rates, and slow growth in model availability. Now, why does this matter, right? because falling demand for EVs could impact the big car makers. And this is why it matters. They've invested billions of dollars in developing EV models and ramping up production, uh, but they've said that uh, this slowing down of, of some of their plans is ha happening for EVs amid softened demand over the past quarters. Now, let's talk about the one chip challenge, the PACU one chip challenge. I'm, I'm sure you've heard about that. Well, it's not good news here. A medical examiner has linked a teen's death to a spicy tortilla chip challenge on social media. According to the autopsy, the teen from Massachusetts had a congenital heart defect. It found that Harris uh, Uloba died from eating a large quantity of chili pepper extract. Harris was eating chips manufactured by PACU when he died in September last year. Paki is owned by Hershey. It pulled the product after uh, Harris's death. The Paki chip contains a warning that says the chip is for adults only and, and should be kept out of reach of children. But there are no precautions to stop children from buying those chips. And Meta facing fresh scrutiny in the European Union over child safety concerns. Today, the European Union opened formal investigations into, into whether Facebook and, uh, and Instagram's algorithm could stimulate addictive behavior in children. NTD's Sean Marshall has more. The European Union opened investigations today into Facebook and Instagram. This is over concerns that the social media platforms are failing to protect children online and that Facebook and Instagram has violated the EU's Digital Services Act, or DSA. The European Commission said it's concerned that the algorithmic systems used by Facebook and Instagram to recommend content, like videos and posts, could exploit the weaknesses and inexperience of children and stimulate addictive behavior. They're going to feed you information that they think you want. And for the most part, they're right on. So if you go on and you are interested in beauty, you know, products and you start looking into beauty products, they're going to right off the bat then give you another recommendation after it that is very much aligned with beauty. The EU is worried that the algorithm could reinforce the so-called rabbit hole effect that leads users to increasingly disturbing content. But as it keeps going, you know, the theme stays the same, but they might be shifting you into possibly body issues or something to that effect. But 
the gist of it is that they want to keep you on. That is their goal. The cases announced Thursday aren't the first for Facebook and Instagram. They're already being investigated under the DSA over concerns they're not doing enough to stop foreign disinformation ahead of EU elections next month. Sean Marshall, NTD News. So we're getting close to wrapping up uh, this earnings season, Q1 earnings season, but we still have a few big ones left. And Walmart is one of them today. Its stock jumped over 7% thanks to a better than expected first quarter uh, results. Here's Walmart U.S. President and CEO John Ferner on the earnings call earlier. We saw big improvements all across the U.S. and that's that was really exciting. In, in terms of the consumer, it's been pretty consistent, I think is the best word we would use. Um, consistent spending across income groups. We've had more growth, as we mentioned in, in the earlier remarks, on the high-end consumer. At the same time, Walmart also saying that customers are spending more on necessities and cutting back on discretionary goods. Also noted that uh, shoppers are shifting to more affordable private brands over national brands. Uh, Walmart also reporting a surge in online sales. It says that growth was driven by pickup and delivery services. Walmart reported more than $5 billion in profits for the first quarter compared to $1.6 billion a year ago. And for more uh, detailed breakdown on Walmart earnings, I uh, earlier spoke to Dia Iyer, Retail Director at SMP Global Ratings. Here she is. Dia, thank you very much for coming on the show this afternoon. Appreciate it very much. So Walmart, many consider it to be a bellwether for the economy, for consumers. So let's start off there. How is the consumers behaving from what we're seeing uh, in this earnings report? Yeah, thanks for having me. And you're right, it was a great quarter for Walmart. And I think it does show us that the U.S. consumer is more resilient than we thought. They're definitely drawing that affluent customer in a trade down. They're definitely growing their e-commerce and winning business in groceries. So I think it does speak to the idea that the shopper in the U.S. is spending, but it has to be a deal. There has to be value because their wallet is, is very tight right now. Would you consider that uh, as a sign at all that potentially further down the line, we could see some waning in consumer spending? Any sign here? Yeah, it's definitely a concern. I think that the cash balances people had post pandemic have come down. I think that people spent a lot on experiences over the past year or two that shifted into sort of more essentials. And, and so that's where we are. Inflation is still, it's improving, but it's still there. Items are expensive that are more essential, including healthcare, rent, gas. So even though people are using their discretionary spending more towards things that are non-experience, we do think that there's only so much left for people in the U.S. to use, and we're, we're definitely going to be keeping an eye for this rest of this year. And we're seeing Walmart attracting more wealthier customers, over $100,000 a year. Uh, is there anything to be said here uh, in your expertise? Yeah, the, the trade down to these low prices is appealing to everyone in America right now. So certainly the affluent customer, but still obviously the middle to low income customer is coming in. Traffic was very good. Their merchandising has improved in areas like apparel. They have a strong uh, variety of general merchandise now that they say is doing better and is becoming more deflationary, which is a good thing. Prices are coming down. So that whole combination of factors, it's bringing people into the store, it's bringing them online. And you know, Walmart, they put their guidance up towards the top end. So it, it does seem like a more favorable story, at least for them, for 24. What would you say is uh, the biggest contributing factor in Walmart's growth right now? Yeah, so their growth is driven by a few things. I do think they're taking market share from some of the more expensive grocery stores. I do think their online and their apparel businesses are probably taking some share from department stores in the U.S. So in, they're just bringing customers away from other options into their stores in a, in a really effective way. And that's true internationally, too, by the way. That, that was really strong as well, their results overseas. And let's talk a little bit about the e-commerce side when it comes to Walmart. And when we mention that, of course, the first thing that comes to comes to mind is Amazon, right? What is the dynamic here between Walmart's e-commerce and Amazon? 
Yeah, so, you know, obviously Amazon a behemoth, they have a lot of private label, different labels they can bring in. I think Walmart is trying to grow that third party experience as well. They're expanding their marketplace, they're expanding their ad business. So in some ways, there's a view that Amazon and Walmart are starting to look more similar. There's more tech elements to Walmart and Amazon is continuing to attract their own customers away from them in a way that I think uh, has become much closer than maybe people expected this year. All right, just one more thing here. Are consumers trading down? In the U.S., they certainly are on things like food. They certainly are on um, wait, waiting on apparel merchandise or buying private label. Uh, but in others, not necessarily. There's some high-end uh, luxury type players that we covered doing really well. So um, I think most of this country definitely that is appealing, but there, there is that small group that you know doesn't really need to do that right now. All right. Thank you very much for your time today, Dia Iyer, S&P Global Ratings. And in a new ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court says a consumer watchdog group can keep up operations. So what we're talking about here is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFBP, uh, was created in response to the 2008 financial meltdown. It regulates consumer financial product, uh, products such as credit cards, mortgages, and car loans. It was the brainchild of Senator Elizabeth Warren. Critics argue that it was unconstitutional for the agency to be funded by the Federal Reserve instead of uh, directly through congressional appropriations. So today's ruling is considered a win uh, for the Biden administration. In dissent, Judge uh, Samuel Alito said that the majority's opinion gave far too much leeway to the agency. Now, just taking a short break, uh, but coming up later, Microsoft is reportedly asking some of its China-based staff to consider transferring outside of the country amid China-U.S. tensions. Meanwhile, Russia's Putin and China's Xi pledge a new era in condemning the United States. We'll tell you what happened right after these commercials. Don't go away. All right, welcome back. I have some quick updates for you on what else is happening today. Boeing supplier Spirit Aerosystems is laying off several hundred workers, according to its spokesperson. Now, Boeing is Spirit Aerosystems' biggest customer. Spirit is dealing with high debt and slowed production at Boeing. Uh, as you all know, Boeing has been hit by a safety crisis. And online furniture seller Wayfair is set to open its first ever brick and mortar store soon. And the move comes as the company is struggling with sluggish sales and more need for marketing spending. The store will be located in Illinois and open to shoppers on May 23rd. As well, UPS has enlisted Wall Street titan Goldman Sachs to manage its $43 billion pension fund assets in the U.S. and Canada. For Goldman, the deal underscores the importance of its asset management business. It's trying to cut dependence on the volatile trading and investment banking business. And we have some China-related stories for you. Microsoft is reportedly asking some of its China-based staff to consider transferring outside the country. This is according to a Wall Street Journal report as well as Reuters. This comes as U.S.-China relations are strained amid a race for cutting-edge technology. Washington has been trying to limit Beijing's access to advanced chips used in AI applications. Uh, there are concerns that the technology can be used to strengthen China's military. Microsoft is asking about 700 to 800 people who are involved in machine learning and other computing-related work to consider relocating. Uh, this is according to the Wall Street Journal. The employees are mostly engineers of Chinese nationality, and they were recently offered an option to transfer to the U.S., Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. NTD, though, could not independently verify those details. As well, Russian President Vladimir Putin is in China today meeting with Chinese regime leader Xi Jinping. And as you know, Putin has just begun his fifth term as the Russian president. Uh, and Russia and China are continuing to strengthen their so-called No Limits Partnership. This is Putin and Xi's fourth face-to-face -face meeting since Russia launched its invasion of Ukraine. Today, the two issued a joint statement on deepening their partnership. 
And Russia detailed its uh, new partnership in a statement. Some of the highlights include uh, increased share of national currencies in bilateral trade. They will also expand access to agricultural products like soybeans and grains. Russia and China plan to cooperate in information and communication technologies as well, which of course includes artificial intelligence. And as well, plus, they will work together on energy, oil, natural gas, coal, electricity, and nuclear power. And moving on from China-related stories here, here in the U.S., a deadline is looming for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to respond to a Republican probe. But lawmakers are investigating why the organization is accepting donations from a particular left-leaning group. NTD's Virginia Gibson has more. Republican Congressman Jason Smith, chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee, is investigating the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, asking why Washington's biggest business advocacy organization has received $12 million from the Tides Foundation. Why is the Tides Foundation, which generally funds Black Lives Matter, uh, student protests against uh, against Israel, pro-Hamas, giving money to the Chamber of Commerce. Mike Gonzalez is the author of Next Gen Marxism. He says the Chamber of Commerce normally advocates for pro-business policies, but, he says, it recently started advocating for big government. He believes Republicans are wondering whether the Tides Foundation donations are involved. Congressman Smith, in a letter to the Chamber of Commerce, says, the Tides Foundation partners with and sponsors several anti-business organizations that seem to directly contradict the USCC's stated mission. He asks, does USCC share the vision of the Tides Foundation? If not, why would USCC accept funds from a group so opposed to its mission? After the 2020 election and during the 2020 election, the Chamber of Commerce definitely did move a little bit to the left. Um, and tried to pander towards more moderate Democrats. Investigative researcher Parker Thayer says the chamber moved left around the year 2020. Meanwhile, the donations came between 2018 and 2022. My guess is that the Tides Foundation is using the Chamber of Commerce to try and advocate for the uh, kind of left-wing criminal justice reforms uh, that more libertarian-minded people might be open to. Um, But those... uh, The reforms are definitely anti-business. Congressman Smith questions whether the Chamber of Commerce still qualifies for tax-exempt status. He's asked the organization to respond to his inquiry by close of business Monday. Virginia Gibson, NTD News. All right, that's all the stories we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching. And if you have any feedback for the episode, please feel free to let me know. You can email me at business at ntd.com or leave a comment online. And I do read them, by the way, for every episode. And as I always say before we leave, business matters. Goodbye. See you tomorrow.